um, NOPE stands for Narcotics Overdose Presentation Education. And what they are is they are a team of volunteers who are committed to reducing the number of accidental overdose deaths in our community. They are so committed to our community. And how they do this, they accomplish this by sharing powerful student presentations. They do this mostly in middle and high schools across our district. More than 120,000 uh, Hillsborough County students have experienced some of those note presentations. And it has changed and saved hundreds of lives. And you should see, it's, it's a huge presentation. And what they've done is they scale back because of our coronavirus. We're, we're limited to doing web videos. And so they've had to do a lot of adjustments with this presentation. And they did these adjustments just for you, our parents, today. So this afternoon, the NOPE team is going to share stories with you of local students losing their lives to this epidemic of addiction and overdose death. And they also are going to share some tips and ways for you as a parent that you can recognize that if your child might be using drugs. They're going to give you some suggestions on how to have these difficult conversations, and they're going to share some resources to confront those substance abuse on, uh, head on right there in your home. And a phenomenal, phenomenal um, information session for you, for you. So what I'm going to do without further ado, I'm going to now turn the presentation over to the NOPE Task Force. Um, and here she is. Well, good afternoon. Oh, I did want to say one thing before, before you come on. I did want to say one thing. If you have any questions, please um, type the questions in the chat box, and um, we will feed the questions to the team, and they will be answer, able to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. All right, there we go. <laughs> well done, Angela. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for attending this webinar for your children. My name is Beth Butler, and I'm a member of the Narcotics Overdose Prevention Education Task Force, better known as NOPE. Now, joining me this afternoon is going to be one of our family speakers, Juan Querion, and he will be sharing his sister's story. Also joining us is going to be former Deputy Superintendent of our Hillsborough County School District, Kathy Valdez. NOPE is a nonprofit organization that was formed back in 2004 when a mom and a dad experienced their son overdosing, and they realized that there wasn't a lot of education going on in the high school level before he went away to college, which is where he overdosed. Nope shares very purposefully blunt, emotional presentations to middle and high school students throughout Hillsborough County School District. There are 14 active chapters around the nation but we are the most active because we are the sixth largest school district in the nation. During the note presentations, we share three very important topics. The students will walk in and they'll receive a brochure that looks like this, that reads, just one time can kill. During the 50 minute presentation that we share on their campus, we tell the students to please break your code of silence and be that hero and step up and get help for someone in your life if they are struggling with any type of substance use or abuse. We also remind them that just one time can kill you. That first time that they pick up a vaping device and it's laced with something that they have no idea what the drug dealer has put inside of it could kill them. That first time of experimenting a smoking weed that was laced with fentanyl, it could instantly kill them. And we remind them of that. And the other thing that we remind the students of during the 50 minutes that we're there helping to change and save their lives is we remind them to make the call and dial 911. Make sure that you know about the Good Samaritan Law that we talk about in just a little bit with you all as parents and never leave a friend behind thinking they're going to just sleep it off. We know that changing lives is our mission and helping to reduce the number of overdose deaths in our community is where we are headed with these 15 minute presentations. Today, we're going to talk to you about several important issues concerning your children. And we wanna again, thank you. We applaud you for taking this next hour to learn a little bit more about what trending drugs look like, what are some ways to spot substance use in your own family, ways to address this topic head on. 
but before we go any further, we want to share with you this powerful video that was created by the Blake High School TV and film production students that show exactly what we are trying to combat. His brother's 19 and he's really responsible, okay? I don't know, Brett. It doesn't sound safe. Logan's a really good kid and I can come back first thing tomorrow. Okay, fine. But you've got to check in with me before you go to bed. Thank you, Mom. Love you! I love you too. Text me! Left, go left. Bro, I'm trying, these controllers suck. Bro, come on, clearly it's not the control. Oh, that's uh, that's probably Brett. Dude, you invited Brett? Uh, yeah, why? He's a baby, he's not gonna wanna do anything fun. Dude, come on, Brett's cool now, I promise. Fine. Hey guys. So, uh, how you doing, Brett? Good. How about you, Isaiah? Oh, um, hey, Brett. So, uh, did you bring it? Oh, yeah, it's right here. Oh, that's awesome! Yo, dude, you have Halo 5? That's crazy. Yeah, Shit. I just got it the other day. You have to play it. Yeah, come on. Let's go! What are you doing? Okay, I got it, so, like, just stay over there. Hey, Logan. Head and out. Pause it. Talk to my brother. All right. Party. Oh, yeah. Uh, can uh, can we come? There's no way I'm bringing my little brother, and his friends, to a party. Of course. Uh, well, can you uh, can you at least you know, give us some air? Okay. No. Um, I left the card on the table. You get yourself some pizza. Play a little video games. Oh, and don't go in my room. Fine. 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 Close the door. Fine. <laughs> I got him. What are those? I don't know, but my brother says they get you like super high. Really? Yeah, and they only take like 10 seconds to kick in. Can't people die from that or get addicted? I told you he'd chicken out. Be cool, man. People take things like this all the time. Plus, if you don't like him, you don't ever have to try him again, okay? I think I'll pass. Okay, fine. Why don't you go be a buzzkill somewhere else? I say, fine. Uh, all right, whatever. Forget it. Let's do this. Uh, you sure? You sure these are all right? <sighs> Not you too, man. Come on. 
On three. On three. One, One two, two, three. three. What's going on? I, I don't know, dude. Something's wrong. I he, I think he, he might have overdosed. It, it, it's bad, Fred. It, it, it's bad. What are you doing? You could get us all in trouble. Isaiah, he could die. You can't tell anyone. Do you do you understand? I I have to. I'm sorry. the video is played, we say to the students, please know that the Good Samaritan Law, the 911 Good Samaritan Law, protects you from any type of legal trouble if you are making a phone call to save a friend's life. So we encourage the students, don't leave a friend behind at a party thinking they're just going to sweep it off. Make that call to 911 and save someone's life and we show them the various signs of overdose that are listed inside of that brochure that I held up just a few moments ago before the video started. We remind them of the different signs of overdose, and then again, we tell them the 911 Good Samaritan Law will protect you and the person you're calling for that you think might be overdosing from any type of legal ramification, no matter if you were smoking weed or drinking underage. I'd like to share just a couple of our task force member stories who unfortunately are no longer here to speak for themselves. This is Spencer Foster. He was over at Farnell Middle School as an eighth grader, and he was really looking forward to playing football for the Sickles High School football team because as an eighth grader, he was already five foot six and 180 pounds, but he never made it to his freshman year at Sickles. He was found dead in his dad's house over the summer. And when his mother, Michelle, one of our task force member family speakers, shares her son's story, she talks about how she zipped up the body bag around Spencer's body before he was carted away to the medical examiner's office. This 
next young boy is Brandon's son. You might have heard his story. It was talked about in the Tampa Bay Times a couple of years ago, and it was on the news. He was a sophomore over at Freedom High School, and he and his friends, after finishing their sophomore year over the summer, decided to go to the Sunshine Skyway rest area one afternoon. While they were there, according to the friend's report, the boys started experimenting with LSD, and Brandon got separated from his friends. They couldn't find him anywhere. So they said to each other, you know what? Let's go ahead and put up a couple tents. We'll spend the night here, even though it's not an overnight campground area, and we'll look for him tomorrow morning. The next day they wake up, they search for their best friend, Brandon. They still couldn't find him. And you know what they did? They got in their cars and they drove back to their houses in New Tampa. They didn't tell Brandon's mom. They didn't text Brandon's brother. They didn't stop by the family's house, even though one of them lived in the same neighborhood. They didn't tell a policeman. They did absolutely nothing. And 33 hours later, that young boy's body was snagged by a fishing line by a teenager just about his age. I remember reading that article in the newspaper and thinking, didn't Brandon's best friend sit in a presentation like we share with these middle and high school students in our school district and learn about that 911 Good Samaritan law? Any of them, even though they had been participating in the LSD use, could have made that call and possibly kept that young boy alive. I want to share just a little bit of information about some of the trending drugs and issues going on in our area. I'm not sure if you're aware, but every single day across our nation, 2,500 teenagers try prescription pills for the first time simply for the sake of getting high. And we know vaping has become a huge issue in our nation. In fact, when we started out the school year with our presentations, that number on the slide was only three. There were only three deaths in the United States of America from vaping. And by the time we finished our last presentation over at Middleton High School on March 13th, I'll never forget it, it was right before spring break and everything started to shut down, the number had increased to 68. We let the students know that vaping is a big deal. The research is out. And vaping not only is shutting down people's lungs and creating what's called popcorn lungs, it's actually putting people like this young teenager in Illinois in a coma. His parents actually told the doctors that they let their son vape. They thought it was a lot better than smoking weed. But the doctors have said to his family that if he does wake up out of his coma, this young man will never breathe normally again. And we remind the kids, this is just too big of a risk to take. Please turn your attention, if you could, to the screen for a short public service announcement that was created by Shad Cronister, our sheriff, and Jeff Akins, our former superintendent of schools. Vape pens, this little device, is a growing problem among students in Hillsborough schools and across our community. Using a vape pen might seem like it's not a big deal. But I'm here to tell you, it can change your entire future. I'm Hillsborough County Sheriff Chad Cronus. And I'm Hillsborough School Superintendent Jeff Akins. If you're caught with a vape pen at school, you could face discipline or suspension. And if that vape pen has anything else in it, like THC oil or wax, it's not only illegal, it's a felony, and you will be arrested. Having a felony on your record can be life-altering. Your acceptance to college. Getting financial aid or scholarships could be at risk. How will you go to school? On every job application, you have to tell them that you're a felon. How would you get hired? Some apartments won't even rent to felons. Do you want to live with your parents forever? A felony is pretty severe. It's not something you're just going to deal with as a juvenile. So please, be smart. Don't ruin your future over vaping. It's just not worth it. Put down the pen. Put down the pen. Put down the pen. Your child may be buying them locally still, but because of COVID-19 and the shutdown of many different essential businesses, they may not have free access to them. So please listen to Kathy Valdez later when she talks about 
strange packages arriving at your doorstep. Your child needs to understand that these vaping devices can sometimes be filled with products that they have no idea what is inside of them and it can kill them instantly. Let's spend just a few moments talking about marijuana, which is a very hot topic right now. You know, some of the messages that our children are getting is that it's going to be legal soon anyway. What's the big deal? But we need to be that strong voice. We need to be that voice of reason that the pot of today is not the pot of the 70s. And the THC levels are many, many times higher. And drug dealers, as I mentioned before, are oftentimes lacing the marijuana that your children have access to with fentanyl. And I'm sure you've heard as an adult that fentanyl is a substance that can kill a human being instantly by touching or inhaling one single particle of it. So please, look at these four things that your teenager has probably already said to you or might come back at you saying, come on, it's a plant. It's safe, it's organic. There are comebacks to that, and I encourage you to Google it. But one of them would be the poppy seed that produces heroin is also a plant. It's no worse than alcohol, sometimes they'll say. Well, however, it still is a federal crime to possess marijuana. No matter what our cities, states, counties are doing, it is a federal crime to have pot, particularly as a 14, 16, 18 year old. Now, some of them will say, no one's overdosed from marijuana. Please understand, I know this is a very controversial topic, but the latest research is saying that marijuana oftentimes brings about psychotic psychosis behaviors. And you also know and have heard that marijuana has caused an increased car accidents taking place, and people have actually committed suicide by jumping off of a balcony when under the influence of marijuana. So you're correct, child. No one has overdosed from marijuana, but the side effects and the repercussions of this are just too big of a risk. And the last thing that they'll say to you, especially these days, it's going to be legal everywhere, mom, come on. It is not legal here. It is a federal crime. And please don't let me walk down that road as a teenager. Let's talk about edibles for just a moment if we could. You know, when you think of edibles, you think of marijuana brownies, right? But boy, the edibles that our children have access to are mind boggling. And we need to be aware of this. And please know that when children start to take edibles to get the marijuana out of it, it takes longer for it to affect them than it would smoking it. So children oftentimes will eat a couple gummies and say, oh, I didn't feel anything. Let's have a few more and let's have a few more. And then it hits them 45 minutes later or whatever based on their body type. And what's happened is students, teenagers are being hospitalized. Even a couple in Hillsborough County School District just a couple of years ago were hospitalized with some products that were brought to school and ingested and they thought it wasn't hitting them so they kept eating and ended up in the hospital because of edibles. This slide shows many trending drugs and the vital role that you can play as an adult is staying informed as a parent, as someone who is a caregiver for a teenager and stay involved in that teenager's life and know when to step in. You should look through their backpack for things like this. You should look inside their shoes. Yes, teenagers still hide things in their shoes. You have every right to be in your child's room at any point in time. And I know they think it's their domain and it's off limits to you, but it's your house. It's your home. And people are stealing prescription pills from their own family's medicine cabinet or from a relative's medicine cabinet or over at a friend's house. So please, Lock up your drugs. We unfortunately didn't have the National Drug Take Back campaign because of COVID-19, but we will have it eventually. And we will have a resource on the resource page that Kathy Valdez will talk about shortly that tells you what you can do to dispose of your drugs properly until that National Take 
back drug campaign goes across our community. Parties that your children attend oftentimes will have a big glass bowl at the front entrance and they'll drop pills just like what you're seeing on the screen randomly into the bowl and start taking them. Your child is who they hang with. Know who your child is hanging with and be on top of what's going on in their life. You have that right. Hillsborough County Emergency Medical Services, unfortunately, answered more than 4,000 overdose calls last year. That was almost double the number of calls in the year before. Thankfully, not everyone died from their overdose because of something that is called Narcan. Narcan is actually a nasal spray that delivers a substance called naloxone, and it helps to temporarily reverse an overdose from opioids. This will only work on opioid overdoses, so if you know of someone who is living with someone struggling with substance abuse, an addiction particularly to opioids, such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, heroin, please let them know about naloxone and Narcan, the delivery system for it, because it is a very simple process of just peeling, placing, pressing, and pushing. And that is how easily people can administer and temporarily reverse an overdose. But please be aware before anybody starts to administer the naloxone drug going through Narcan into someone overdosing, they need to dial 911 first because that person is going to eventually go back into overdose mode and they need to have a professional medic with them when that happens. Underage drinking. I'll never forget when Good Morning America had that report just a couple of school years ago that almost half the eighth graders had already tried drinking in our nation. It's an epidemic. And I know that so are the opioids, so is marijuana, but underage drinking is still an epidemic. So please be aware of that and be aware of this, that our state of Florida has what's called a hosting law. And what that means is you should not host a party in your house where you're allowing drinking going on with underage kids. I know it may seem like you're the cool parent making that happen, letting it go on, but it really can put you at risk for losing your home, losing all of your savings, experiencing jail time, ruining your reputation, and you'll live through emotional turmoil for quite a while as you try to regroup. So please, don't always be your child's friend. Be the wall and set the example. This is an image of the human brain. And the one on the left is a very healthy brain. The one on the right is after seven years of heroin and methadone use. We share this image with the children during the student presentation, right before our family speaker comes on. And we remind the student, we are not here to tell you don't use drugs. We're here to say, here's what happens. If you begin experimenting at a young age, your chances of addiction are so much higher and your brain will have an image like that. We let them know that if every single one of them in the audience of that presentation, whether it's a gymnasium or a cafeteria or a beautiful theater, we let them know that if they start experimenting at their young age, that over 45% of them will suffer from some type of addiction later in life because of their early experimentation. We let them know that it is not just their life, it is the life of all of those around them that will suffer from their choices early in life. We are here today, and again, I thank you all so much for being here. I commend you for spending this hour with us because we're going to do this together. We've heard the saying, it takes a village. 
and we're going to join our forces today more so than ever before as Juan Querion shares his story, Brenda, of her addiction and her challenges with substance use and abuse. Juan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Beth, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, so before I s tell you the story about my sister, Brenda, and what led to her uh, child abuse or her substance abuse, um, I think it's important that I share some of the factors that may lead to substance abuse because you don't just wake up one day and decide that you're going to drink or uh, drug your life away, right? Um, something has to trigger this behavior. So, for example, the first uh, fact I'd like to share with you is your environment. So, depending on where you grew up, uh, you could be exposed to both drugs and uh, alcohol abuse. And oftentimes, you become part of this environment, you know, unless you change your scenery, quite frankly. Um, another factor to consider, and I think we've, we've all been here, right, is uh, peer pressure. So, you see your friends drinking, doing drugs smoking, laughing, having a good time, so out of curiosity, you want to become part of this and you want to try it. And finally, a traumatic event, and this could be bullying, right? You experience a divorce, death in a family, or even child abuse, whether if it's uh, physical, verbal, or uh, sexual. My sister and I, unfortunately, we were exposed to uh, all, these, uh, all these factors that I mentioned. Uh, however, the most impactful one uh, was dealing with a traumatic event. My sister and I uh, were both uh, victims of, uh, of child abuse, but we both kept it a secret. Uh, we didn't even know about each other's abuse until about 2012, um, the year that she uh, passed away at the age of uh, 32. Growing up, my sister was known as a rebel, um, and even though you can't really tell from some of the pictures that you're, that you're seeing, right, she, she's showing a big smile and also had a big laugh. But at the age of 13, uh, she swallowed an entire bottle of Tylenol um, pills and had to be flown to a Boston area uh, airport to get her stomach pumped. Fast forward, I graduated um, high school in 95. Uh, about a year later, uh, I moved to Florida for a better life. Uh, Brenda was 15 at the time that I moved to Florida. You know, so I was homesick. Um, I would often check in, you know, check in with the family. Uh, but unfortunately, my conversations with my sister weren't as pleasant uh, as you would expect. Uh, you know, I remember her sounding drunk, slurring her words, and not making much sense. When, when I would visit, she didn't want me to leave. Um, and ultimately, I would hear from other family members and friends that she was heavy into drugs and, uh, and alcohol. But we didn't know why. Brenda actually tried living a, a normal life. You know, she was in a relationship but ended up having two beautiful girls. And these girls gave her the motivation to start to change. Although the relationship with the girl's father didn't last, she still ends up finding love and, and gets married. But the marriage also came with its own challenges, right? drugs, alcohol, and even abuse. Unfortunately, by this time, the years of alcohol and drug abuse had already taken its toll on her mind and body. Brenda was depressed and started seeing a therapist who then prescribed her antidepressants. It seemed like the sessions were working though. You know, I remember speaking with Brenda one day and for the first time in years, uh, she sounded sober. She didn't sound either drunk or high. So fast forward to the summer of 2011. Uh, my sister breaks her silence. And let me tell you, it was one of the worst calls that I have ever received. She tells my mom and her siblings that she had been sexually abused by a close family member. The family, you know, as you can tell, was torn apart by this news. Um, but in support of my sister, I too break my silence. And by this time, I had already shared my experience with my wife many years before. And to this day, you know, the close family member obviously denies the allegations uh, made by my sister. And if you could imagine, you know, during this time, uh, you know, I'm trying to juggle my career, parenthood, and I wasn't even in college. And, but ironically, you know, I think that things happen for a reason. Uh, ironically, I was 
taking a human development course at Eckerd College, and I needed a subject to do my research paper on. And voila, with everything that going on, I chose to do it on child abuse. And thankfully, the research provided valuable information that helped me understand Brenda's behavior. She was she had been masking her pain with drugs and alcohol. That was the only way that she uh, she could do it. Now, almost a year went by, and on November 20th, 2012, I get a call from my mother telling me that Brenda has been hospitalized. At this time, we didn't have much information. I thought she was just sick. However, the next call I received was just heartbreaking. My sister had suffered a cardiac arrest and was not showing any signs of brain activity. Brenda had ultimately overdosed on the antidepressant medications that she was taking. On Thanksgiving Day, I had to fly out to Springfield, Massachusetts, for the city that we grew up. Brenda was pronounced brain dead and being kept alive by machines. Every day, we would visit the hospital, just hoping that the doctors would share some good news. But that never happened. My siblings and I were torn. We had to make a, 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 the toughest decision really that the, that the family had to make. My middle brother and I, we wanted to end the suffering. She had suffered too much already. My younger siblings were just hanging on to every last hope that they could. And to see if uh, um, the doctors would come back with, with some sign of, you know, uh, uh, that Brenda would start showing some any brain activity. But ultimately, the, the family, uh, including Brenda's husband, uh, had agreed to pull the plug. Three short breaths, and she was gone. I share this story with you because the more you know, the greater the impact you can have in someone's life. So please, in closing, break your silence, speak up because it could be life-changing. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Juan, very much. Yeah, this is our eighth school year of um, sharing student presentations on our campuses and parent presentations after hours. And uh, there's never a time where a story is shared by one of the family speakers that I don't stop and catch my breath and thank God because our son struggles with addiction. He has since he was a junior at Alonzo High School, took a half a Xanax walking through Citrus Park Mall and went down that road of addiction to hydrocodone, oxycodone, and by the grace of God, he's in recovery going on year number six. But those stories are stories that will reach your children. People make decisions based on emotion. And we pray every time before we go on stage at your children's school that we will change at least one life. And Juan, thank you. Thank you for having the strength and the grace to share Brenda's story and the struggle. Because it will change the trajectory path of many students' lives and many families' lives whose parents are tuned in right now because Kathy, in just a few moments, is going to share some tips and tools to address this challenge head on in your home. We remind the students when we're there that addiction holds no prejudice. Addiction does not care if you speak Spanish or Arabic or English, if you live on a park bench as a homeless person or you live in a high-rise Park Avenue condominium down in New York City. There is every single walk of life being touched by this disease called addiction. And that is why we try to reach as many middle schools and high schools every school year with our powerful, emotionally, and purposefully blunt presentation. Now I imagine some of you are sitting there thinking, okay, I maybe suspect a little substance use with my child or I found some pills what do I do? What, I mean, how do I handle this? I am so thankful that Kathy Valdez is our chapter president now 
of Nova Hillsborough County, but she held the position of Deputy Superintendent of the Hillsborough County, County School District for years. And I am proud to call her a friend, and she is now going to assist all of us with some more insights on how to detect if your child might possibly be using and how to address that challenge. Kathy Valdez. Hi, thank you, Beth. And thank you for all of you that are here today participating in this webinar. Uh, we certainly appreciate that and pray that you gain some valuable information. Um, as Beth said, I did work 42 years in the school district as a teacher, a principal, um, an area director, and I retired uh, five years ago as the deputy superintendent. Our only child, Michael, died in 2008 uh, at 24 years of age uh, from a prescription pill overdose. Nope of Hillsborough was forming at that time and I began volunteering and helping Nope partner with the school district. Um, and since the, my retirement, as Beth has said, I'm spending a great deal more time um, with Nope and volunteering to spread the message of awareness and prevention. It is so important to be aware of what your child is up to. Don't catch that not my child attitude. Take it from me, it can happen to anyone. Keep your finger on the pulse of your child's life daily in these early teen years. When it comes to their bedroom, as Beth said earlier, it's not their space. And you may, it is, I mean, you, you, there, it's their bedroom, but you may think to snoop or not to snoop. Well, you know what? Snooping is your right. Start in those early years with that habit of going into their room, going into their space and having conversations with them and looking for signs. Most of us know someone who has struggled or is struggling with substance abuse. And it's so unfortunate that in our country, this epidemic of addiction and accidental overdose has reached such a crisis level. There are certain risk factors that um, make it more likely that an individual will become involved and possibly addicted to drugs or alcohol. And some of these risk factors are on the screen. An early age of first use. We tell the uh, students in our presentations, and Beth mentioned it to you earlier, that if they start experimenting with alcohol or drugs in their middle school years, that 45% of them that's almost half of the auditorium or half of the group that, we'll be, that we're speaking to will suffer this, the, this disease of addiction. Also a family history. We remind students that addiction does run in families. And while it's not always hereditary, it does certainly increase a person's chance of, of struggling with substance abuse. Psychological problems, of course, they contribute. Sensation uh, seeking. A child that has this, this uh, knack for taking unnecessary risks, that no fear attitude, hanging out with the wrong crowd. As Seth said, we are who we hang with. And lastly, if your child or his friends are surrounded by a perceived uh, acceptance of substances, including the overuse of alcohol or recreational use of marijuana or other illicit drugs, then chances are that in your child, that your child will approach drugs with, ah, not a big deal attitude. And that would increase with each of these risk factors. This is why you're modeling good behavior when it comes to your own alcohol use and abstaining from marijuana use in front of your child is crucial. There are a great many things that you may already be doing though that we call protective factors. And that is, things that might prevent them from ever walking down that path of experimenting with even an alcoholic drink before they're 21. Things such as having strong bonds within your family, making sure that you spend good quality time together, that you're involved with your kids' lives in a positive but yet unobtrusive way. What does that look like? Well, when they have their friends over, you don't have to be right in the middle of that and the center of attention. You're off to the side, maybe in another room, but with an ear to what's going on. That's being unobtrusive. That you have set clear expectations and consequences from early years, and that you enforce them consistently. And isn't that the hard part? Consistent enforcement of what we want. 
And hopefully you're having those discussions about your adult view of illegal substances that many kids are experimenting with. All this talk about legalization of marijuana, that can stir up some really interesting dinner conversations that may pro provide great opportunity for rich discussion. Well, let's spend a few minutes talking about some possible signs of substance abuse or substance use. Have you noticed that any of your liquor uh, in your liquor bottles is watered down? Have you found a fake ID in your child's backpack or in his room? Are you missing any money or credit cards? Has jewelry, a laptop, a game unit gone missing? These are items that are very easy to sell or to pawn for money to buy pens, those vape pens that we saw, oils, weed, or alcohol. Is your prescription medication missing? We talked about locking up your drugs and, we, and your medication. We talked about that for a reason. Keep track of your prescription medication. Kids are stealing prescription pills from homes of friends and from family. Have you noticed an increase in the number of overnights at your at friend's home? Or maybe your child is having friends that you've never heard of before and they want to spend the night. These would all be possible signs of something going on. There are also some other physical signs that your child may be starting to use drugs. Things such as difficulty falling asleep or insomnia. Or maybe that your child has many times of unexplained napping. Now I realize nowadays that they're inside a whole lot more there with this whole thing of COVID that they're not able to get out. They may be napping a little bit more. We're talking about in normal times when this is a change in behavior. And your child might exhibit drastic changes in sleep schedules or falling asleep at inappropriate times. And also be aware of nodding out. And if you don't know what nodding out is, that means falling asleep while you're even talking with them or when they're in the middle of a sentence to you. That might be an indication of a problem and most likely is an indication of a problem. Your child might experience significant changes in weight, whether that be a weight gain or a weight loss, in eating patterns or evident changes in their gastrointestinal functioning, such as constipation, nausea, abdominal pain. All of those can be signals. Take a really close look at your child during their school years. You should be hugging them a lot, so it gives you a time to get really up close and with them. And be alert for these signs and other possible signs for substance use. Is there a lack of personal hygiene or cleanliness? Are they not wanting to bathe? Are they messy in their appearance? They used to care about what they look like, what they wore, what they wear, and now they're not. Have you noticed an extreme paleness or flushing of their face? Dark or puffy circles under their eyes? Check your child's pupils. Small pinpoint pupils oftentimes reflect the use of opioids, such as oxycontin, hydrocodone, morphine, heroin, methadone. Have you noticed that their skin feels cold or clammy? Or maybe your child is heavily sweating. Again, all possible signs. Now take a look at what your child is wearing. You know, clothing, Certain clothing is specific to the drug world. It always has been. And we want to show you just a few examples. That shoe on the left-hand side, easily drugs can be hidden in the tongue of that shoe. The cap on the right, it also has a place in the band, easy place for hiding or stashing drugs. And the shirt in the middle, it signifies the slang used in the cannabis or marijuana culture for smoking cannabis around 420 on April the 20th. Well, we just passed April 20. That occurs annually, April the 20th. And just last week, we had one. That's all specific to the drug culture. Sometimes there are changes in your child's behavior or personality. That might be a warning sign. Now, remember, we're talking about 
changes in behavior, abrupt changes in their mood, and that's erratic moods, whether it be a real high or a real low, apathetic, meaning they don't care about anything, defensive, you can't say anything to them, critical or excitable, again, those extreme moods, blaming, lying or making excuses for themselves or for friends, but that would become more pronounced. You know, a certain amount of that happens, but if it becomes much more pronounced, you might raise an eyebrow on that and might raise a little concern. Withdrawal from family. That's what happened to my son when he was starting to his use of those pain medications. We noticed a withdrawal from family functions and isolation. Sudden secretiveness or guarded behaviors that might be displayed. These are all things that you may want to look for. Also, and especially during normal times, and I'm sure we're going to be back to normal times, hopefully in the fall, where we'll be back in a regular school setting. You might get the reports from school and they'll have more or new discipline problems, discipline issues that they've never had before or a different type of discipline that issue that they've not experienced. That would certainly be a tip off and cause for some alarm and certainly some discussion with school administrators or teachers. Daydreaming or falling asleep in class. Never a good sign when the student's falling asleep. That is an indication of something going on. It might not be drugs, but it could be drugs. Grades begin deteriorating. Or if they have an after school job, their job performance evaluations become negative instead of the positive ones that they used to enjoy. Attendance becomes erratic. If they miss whole days of school, especially that you don't know about, or a few classes here and there, uh, or not showing up for school at all, or not showing up for that job that we talked about, those would certainly be some indications. Also, oftentimes, your child may change their friend group when they begin experimenting with or using substances. That would certainly raise some concern. New or different friends start coming to your house, especially ones that may be considerably older in, than your child. That would be certainly a, a, a signal for alarm. Increased uh, secrecy about their actions. Places that are places that they're going. They don't want to tell you where they're going. They don't want you around their possessions. Certainly don't come in my room. That would certainly be a tip off. Their hobbies or their sports or their extracurricular activities that they used to be involved in and used to enjoy and probably excel at. That's given up and now everything's just boring. That's the definite sign. You already heard that going to your child's room should begin early in their life and should be the norm at, from an early age. You have the right to know about every single thing that enters your home. And some of the things that you should be looking for that you might suspect your child is using are packages from China. Now, I know a lot of stuff comes from China, but if packages come to your child from from China, you really do need to know. If a package comes from anywhere to your child, you need to know what's inside of it. A lot of countries um, are known drug traffickers. They have uh, these, this is just common, and it's drugs are gotten with, it, with ease. Those should be red flags and keep you on your toes for looking out. If you check your child's phone, for text messages or for their social media feeds, and you find that there's some discussion about sauce for the weekend. That refers to alcohol. Met Molly, that refers to MDA or ecstasy pills. Purple drank, that's codeine syrup. White horse or brown sugar, that refers to heroin. Bars, that refers to Xanax. That list goes on and on. Hopefully you will access the resource section of the No Pills for website, and we're gonna share that with you later, that website at the end of this presentation. Uh, because on our website, we mention other websites that you can access so that you can stay up on 
uh, drug culture of today and what these terms mean and what you might want to be looking for because it changes constantly. Well, do you feel that some of these bullets have hit home like a punch in your gut? Now you want some tools, you want some suggestions, some possible to deal with a possible situation with your own child. Don't be misled by the fact that your child is a great student, they're very popular, they're involved in sports. These great kids all can fall prey to the disease of addiction. So we have to keep those conversations going. And here's just a few brief tips. Prior to sitting down with your child, and these conversations should be natural and ongoing and very open. Choose a time when the tensions are low. We all know, and especially now, everybody's pretty stressed out. Probably tensions are pretty high a lot of the time. So make sure that you choose a time for a conversation that the tensions are low. Choose a time when you have time. Don't choose a time to talk when you're just limited maybe 10 or 15 minutes because you never know where these conversations are gonna go and you can't just cut them off. They need to go until they're over. Do not discuss when your child, when you suspect your child is drunk inebriated or high. You know, I wouldn't talk with anybody seriously when they're inebriated or high because you're not going to have a great conversation, but especially with your child if you're wanting a serious conversation. Be genuine. Avoid the scare tactics. They really don't work. Research has proven over and over that scare tactics do not work with children. Also, avoid scolding them or demeaning or shaming them. Let them freely discuss with you and open up with you and know that even if you don't like what you're hearing, that's how they're feeling or that's how they think. You're going to have to deal with it. You're the adult in the, in the situation, but listen and then listen some more. Mental health is really an issue with children, especially today. It could be the stress of academics, and we all know the stakes have gotten higher and higher throughout the years, that that's what's pushing them to be uh, wanting to escape and turning to substances. Or it may be the social media buildup. Social media, they're on it all the time, and that whole buildup may make them feel like they don't fit in. They're not accepted. Recognizing and shaming these feelings, not shaming these feelings is crucial. As I said, don't shame them. Just listen and accept their feelings. Explain to them in this conversation, though, when it's your time to talk, why you're opposed. And do this in a very factual, not emotional way, that why you're opposed to their using alcohol or drugs and how you intend to enforce that position. Be understanding but firm. Be supportive, yet caring. Avoid these idle threats or consequences that you know you're never going to be able to carry out. Those are very damaging. And if this conversation goes in a way that you don't want, you don't feel that it should, and you can't make your, your child make better choices, then by all means, seek professional help. Substance abuse is a serious problem. It can stem from many underlying conditions or issues, some of which Juan alluded to earlier. And on our website again is that section titled resources. And that shares with you many of the options that are available in our county, some that are free of charge, some on a sliding scale or fee schedule. And also, you can contact your child's school administrator or their counselor. Or if your family is in crisis, this is very important. Please listen carefully. If your child, if your family is in crisis, you can dial 211. 211. That's the mental health 911. So dial 211 if you're in crisis and you will be connected to resources 
for mental health or for substance abuse issues. Being informed about your child's academic life is important, but being informed about their social life is crucial to their entire future. Remember, oftentimes your child wants help but does not know how to ask for it. Or maybe they're in a state of denial. They don't even know that he or she has a problem. Many who struggle with substance abuse feel that they have it under control. That's so common. Got it, got it, got this. But we know that's not true. And many, as we said, they attend school on a regular basis when it's in session, they get good grades, and they're able to keep that substance abuse hidden from family and sometimes even from their friends. Keep that conversation going. That's so, so critical. Thank you. So true, so true. Oh, they all think they have it under control, right? Every teenager is invincible. We are about a minute and a half away from closing up. I know we're a few minutes over, and I apologize, but that uh, technical difficulty put us behind by a few. We were our children's first teachers, right? As parents, we were always their first teacher, and you continue to be a teacher in their life. So I encourage you, as we wrap up here, and, and on the tales of what Kathy shared, we are the influence in their life, even though they're at school a lot during a normal situation, and now they're with you so much. You need to be a powerful influence. You need to get involved, like we've talked about, communicate, and communicate with calmness. Like Kathy said, if you find yourself shouting, walk away, be the adult in the situation, and come back later, and walk the walk. If you're smoking weed in front of your child, you are not walking the walk that fits hand in hand with this whole attacking the epidemic of drug use and overdose death. Please, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, walk the walk that you want your child to walk and be the wall. Our children need parameters. They want rules. Even though they bark at them and roll their eyes, they thrive on routine and parameters. So set them and praise and reward when they follow them. Use those praise and reward systems that we used with sticker charts way back when and find something that works with your child in these teen years. Phone, call of duty time, time out with friends once we can roam around again after COVID. You know what works with your child. Praise and reward them with it. And then family meals. Family meals have been proven through research-based reports coming in that those families that spend time to sit down and break bread together are definitely having some great healthy conversations. And we close out our parent presentations every time with having that catchphrase, that catch word or phrase that your child can use to get out of a dangerous situation. Let me give you a quick example. Your daughter goes for an overnight to a friend's house, and all of a sudden they pull out pills, and she does not want to be in there anymore. But she doesn't want to call home and embarrass herself and ask to be picked up. So if she calls home and says, hey, Mom, did you walk Freddie earlier today? That's your catchphrase that you've agreed on, because you don't even have a dog named Freddie. Well, you do, but when she calls home and asks about that, you, you know, that's what you've agreed on, or the word penguin. And she calls and uses penguin in a sentence. That is your cue to go and pick your child up because that's what you've agreed on as a catchphrase. We need to let our children know that we are there for them, not to condemn them that they've made a bad choice. We all have made bad choices in our teen years. We are there to get them out of a bad situation, ask questions the next day when everyone's calm, and be the person that they can turn to any time that they need help. So thank you for being here this afternoon. We are now going to open up for questions, and then we'll share our contact information at the end. Angela? Well, thank you for that. I had to wipe my tears on the story that you all have, but it's so informative. 
so informative and just the tidbits to the look for is for families to be able to determine um, if their child might be heading in the wrong direction. So I thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I don't think that there are a lot of questions. It seems as though you all were clearly clear, um, but if there are any questions, you can go ahead and ask right now. There is a question about where we'll be able to find the presentation. Um, I'm going to have Mercedes type down the information of this video right here is being recorded. This webinar is being recorded and is going to be posted on our YouTube page, and you'll be able to access this webinar and other webinars that we've um, held in the past. Um, and there it is right there if you want to um, copy and paste it into some somewhere, we'll have that. Um, we'll have that available probably tomorrow it will be uploaded. It just takes a while to download and with technology now it's been working really slow. So look for it tomorrow and please share it with your friends, your family, your neighbors. Make sure they see this video. Make sure they participate in this webinar because it's not enough for us to let spread the word. And just so you know, note will be um, participating with, they, they still participate with a lot of middle schools and high schools, and I do encourage, I am the supervisor for, for parent and family engagement in Hillsborough County, and I encourage all of the liaisons that work with me to um, offer courses like that with their students. So um, please, if, if you are a parent or a parent of a school and you would like to see this, talk to the administrators and have them book note to present to the students at their school. So um, once you log into the YouTube page, go ahead and subscribe, and then you'll get notified when the when the presentation Fantastic. is Fantastic. Quick thing, I don't, could I add That's, in, Angela? Yeah. We do have our student presentation yeah. on our website right now because we're unable to travel into school sites. We do, if you go to our home page of the website that's listed right there, nopillsboro.org, you'll see an immediate button to push and witness and experience that 50-minute presentation that we share with students, which is totally different than what you've experienced today. Much more emotional, has their school resource officer involved, a body bag, a 911 call. It is riveting. So until we can get back on campuses, I encourage you to sit down with your child and watch it together on your big screen TV. Thank you, Angela, for letting me add that in. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Definitely. Do, do any of you all have anything else to share, Kathy, Juan, before we close out? No, I just wanted to thank everybody. It's so important, um, and we just appreciate all that that tuned in and uh, for the questions that were asked and, and the interest. Uh, the investment in your child is so worth it. And so we just appreciate parents that are willing to learn and to access uh, sessions such as this. So thank you so much for, for participating. And thank you, Angela, for having us. Well, thank you for taking out the time of day to um, share the information. Um, it's so powerful. So with that, if there are no other, Juan, you have something? No? Nope. Well done. <laughs> okay. So and Beth, do you thank you? All right. Well done, Juan. Yes, thank you for sharing. It was very powerful. So with that, I want to thank everyone again for being here. And again, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you'll be able to get this and the rest of the uh, videos that are made just for parents. Thank you all, and have a blessed Bye. afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Bye.